Hi, everybody. Thank you guys so much for joining us tonight. We are excited for our latest creator hangout, location, location, location. Uh, we are going to have our panel of Series Fest alumni, Kate Shamuris, Frank Zonderlin, Julian Lasser, uh, Jamie Thalman, all here with us in just a couple minutes. Uh, we're excited to host an interactive conversation with our panel of creators about the crucial role that location plays in the production of your shoot. Our panel will share panelists will share trip <laughs> tips and tricks finding a location that suits your needs. Uh, tonight's panel is brought to you by Series Fest, and if you're not familiar with Series Fest, to give you a little bit of background, Series Fest is a nonprofit organization. We're dedicated to championing artists at the forefront of episodic storytelling. We're a year-round organization with educational programs, initiatives supporting underserved voices, and professional development opportunities. Each June, Series Fest culminates in a curated Denver-based festival showcasing innovative episodic content, in competition, independent pilot screenings, panels, workshops, live reads, and network television premieres. To address the essential needs of the community this year, we are pivoting to a virtual celebration of episodic storytelling. The festival will take place as scheduled from June 18th to the 24th and transition to a schedule of virtual events with all panels, competitions, premieres, all available online. Tickets and badges went on sale today. They are now available, so please go find out more at seriesfest.com. A uh, quick plug for a couple of our programs that currently are open for submissions. Um, please check out our Executive Elevation Mentorship Program, which aims to diversify the landscape of TV's top decision makers and our Women's Directing Mentorship, which is in partnership with Shondaland for our second year. Uh, it's designed to discover aspiring female directors. Uh, go to seriesfest.com, please apply and learn more and see what else, what other good stuff is there. Uh, this event today is open to the public with a suggested donation to Series Fest of $10. So if you feel compelled, if you're able to do so, uh, you can donate directly through our Facebook, our Instagram, or our website. Thank you all for being here. Uh, our last um, little bit of business here, we want to thank our generous year-round partners who help bring us great programs like this. Visit Denver, Colorado Creative Industries, and the Colorado Office of Film, Television, and Media. Uh, finally, on to tonight's event. Uh, we are going to be talking about location, 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 important in real estate and in film production. So the way it's going to work is that uh, our panel is going to talk for about 45 minutes. Um, and then for the last 15 or so, we are going to be taking questions from you all on the YouTube chat function. So please make sure to put in your questions on the uh, right side panel of your screen so that we can uh, answer any and all of your exciting questions. So I am now going to ask our panel to please turn on your cameras, turn on your microphone so we can all see and hear you. There's everybody. Hello. Hello, everyone. Hi. Hi. How's it going? Good. How are you? Doing Good. well. Good. And Frank's here. OK, we've got everybody. So everyone is just kind of dealing in the age of COVID. Um, but I don't know who to give props to the most for being here. Either Frank, who is joining us from Amsterdam, where it's 2 o'clock in the morning, or Julian, who is joining us literally from the road, running from COVID. So thank you so much to both of you for being here. It's a pleasure. Yay. Yeah, thanks for having us. Thank you. Uh, I'm going to brag about you guys for a little bit so everybody can get to know you. Um, I'm going to start with Kate. Kate Chamaris is a producer director. Uh, her experience includes a short called Blocks that had its world premiere at Sundance um, this past year. And announced today, Blocks will also be playing Series Fest season six. So all the more reason to buy a badge and buy a ticket. Um, Blocks is phenomenal. So congratulations on that. Um, Kate also produced Unspeakable, which had its world premiere at South by Southwest in 2018. And it also played Series Fest in the same year. She's also worked on studio projects um, with the visual effects producers on the set of Call of the Wild and the season two of The Mandalorian. Thank you for being here, Kate. Thank you, thank you. And now we're on to Jamie. Jamie Thelman is a producer with more than 10 years of experience after starting his career in post-production and is an art director with networks such as E and Freeform. 
Jamie most recently produced uh, Palomino and Swissy, which Julian directed uh, and that premiered at Series Fest in 2019. Thank you for being here, Jamie. It's great to be here too. Thanks for having me. Welcome. Oh, I like the background. It's good. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and then we've got Julian joining us from the road. Julian Lesser is a producer director. Uh, he has produced an Emmy nominated web series. Uh, everyone's crazy, but for but us for Funny or Die. And he also reached the top 10 finalists in the HBO's uh, Project Greenlight Director Competition, which I would love to hear about more actually. Uh, in 2019, Julian won Best Director at Series Fest for Palomino and Swissy. Thank you for being here. Yeah, thank you. Uh, and Frank Zonderland, all the way from Amsterdam, uh, is a creative producer and cinematographer. He shoots narrative, documentary, and commercial projects all over the world. He co-founded Peralt Pictures in Amsterdam, uh, and his project Edward's Miraculous Bookstore premiered at Series Fest Season 5 last year. Thank you, thank you. I hope you go to sleep immediately after this. <laughs> I will. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Um, well, I'm going to try to do my best to let you guys chat. I will just be an observer and then pop in towards the end and we can have a conversation about uh, viewer questions. But uh, Kate, I'll let you take it away. Perfect. All right. Let's dive into it. Um, yeah, I think we have, uh, we have some varied experiences here. So you'll get the gamut from practical locations to studio locations, and we'll try and give you some fun stuff to uh, think about. Uh, I'll throw it over to you gentlemen. Anything that comes to mind when looking for locations that are like, what are your on your checklist of things to, that you just have to have? Um, well, I guess I'll just kick it off. Um, yeah. I think, at least for me, when I'm first starting, I think about the world and the tone of the film that I'm, <clears throat> I'm creating. And so the locations have to fit within that world aesthetically. And then, of course, beyond the aesthetics, you start to think about the logistics, um, you know, all the production elements of crew holding and, and where talent is going to live and, you know, restrooms and all of that sort of nitty gritty stuff. But for me, I love location scouting. And, and for Palomino and Swissy, I hit the road um, in the California desert for about four months to find all the locations. Uh, the, one of them is Jamie's background right now. And um, yeah, I mean, I just get really inspired by seeing places and, and I like to um, you know, take inspiration from the locations that I find and then rework the scripts. You know, sometimes I envision a certain blocking and then I find a location and I think, you know, the final product ends up being stronger because it, it feels more real and, and grounded sometimes with on location um, shooting. Yeah, having that, that flexibility of- That's Emily, by the way, in the background, who's uh, getting uh, gas for us. We're uh, midway through Indiana right now. Amazing. <laughs> yep. Uh, yeah, having that, I would say, like, having that flexibility, too, of, you know, being inspired by the script, but then being inspired by the location and allowing it to almost be like a breathing sort of situation. For sure. Um, what, uh, I know some of the things that we kind of think about, too, is like what the assets are in the in the space too right when you're looking for something are you also looking thinking about lighting are you thinking about um is this already production designed to an extent yeah totally i'm uh, oh Frank, go ahead no well, well um well i i often uh, work with uh my girlfriend annabelle and she loves production design and making sets uh, very visual and sort of uh, yeah with the uh, they add a lot to the story as well so then most of the time we know we have to add a lot 
So we have to find a location that suits that, basically, where we can do where that allows for that. Um, to and then with light as well, because most of the time it's, we're, we we don't use real re realistic light necessarily. It's closer to like magical realism and stuff like that. So then we also need to have the space um, to work with a different kind of light setup than sort of, but yeah, a, a, a normal smaller setup would be. Do you find that you uh, like to work more in a studio space or a practical space? I enjoy studio a lot. <laughs> um, because uh, you, you just have so much space and there's so much luxury to it, actually. Um, I shot a feature in New York uh, two years ago, uh, and it was in a pretty big house, uh, four or five stories. Um, but for a crew of 30 people, it's always too small. And we were there for two weeks, and it's just never big enough. Um, so then you, especially if, yeah, if you want to shoot at a real location, you have to think of, like we couldn't park trailers in front of the of the building or anything. So, but like it would have been better if we had if we would have had two buildings, <laughs> one for for cast and crew and and one for shooting. Uh, but we were just constantly moving stuff around, and it was I mean the house was gorgeous, but from uh, uh, and I think it really added to the film in the end. But from a production point of view, it was a big pain in the ass. Yeah, it's definitely something uh, you can find that perfect location that's perfect for your story. Then you have to take into account um, where are people are going to park, where are people, where are the actors going to hang out, where are the, where's the crew going to hang out, where are you going to eat lunch, where are you going to have crafty set up, um, where are people going to change. It's It's kind of, you have that nucleus of your yeah. location and I mean then... Or or simple spider web of simple breath. stuff like is the air conditioning good enough for 30 people like is it is it going to cool down the house enough that you can play a christmas scene with coats on in the middle of the summer in new york well you can't i can tell you <laughs> well funny to sort of go off of that note uh the location that jamie's in front of right now um, was this abandoned warehouse. It was the opening scene of our series. And basically in this scene, we have this interrogation where these two guys have tortured this guy to find out information about this briefcase that he's stolen full of money. And so the, the location had never been used before in film. And I found it simply by driving around the desert. And I came across this barn and then started to go around to local businesses to try and find out who owned that barn. And then we found out that it was this, um, I don't know how to describe him, but it was this guy who basically ran this small desert town. And so he worked out of this airfield. And so he also owned the barn and we hadn't really looked inside of it, but from the outside, it was deserted. It was just sort of that isolated feeling that was perfect. And, um, you know, you've got these mountains in the background. So it was exactly what we were looking for. And so I pitched this guy um, to let us use that location. And he was sort of a little wishy-washy about it. I think you'll find with some locations, people are less likely to take a risk because they don't want the liability or they've never had filming. So, I mean, this is going to probably get into a topic we'll discuss a little later of how do you convince someone to, to film in your location. But he basically told me, um, you know, uh, let me think about it and I'll, I'll get back to you. And I was so desperate to get this location that I actually drove up the next morning about an hour and 45 minutes out of Los Angeles, showed up at his uh, office. And I said, so did you think about it? Because I, I drove all the way here. I'd really love to shoot in this barn. And he finally agreed, um, not, not because of the sort of you know, uh, amount of money that we were offering him, but he had taken a look at my work and it was just this interesting situation where this guy was really judging us purely based on our history as filmmakers more so than any sort of financial, you know, thing that he would, he'd get from it. Uh, I'm circling back to the weather thing, I promise. Um, and so we go into this barn and it's a disaster. Like there is like fertilizer and all this, terrifying stuff and it was like oh my god we're gonna 
we can't have our actors show up here and they're going to look at all these chemicals and, and be freaked out. So I think that's another thing to think about in locations, especially on indie films is, are people going to be comfortable shooting in these spaces? Like, are people going to look at these bags of chemicals and start wondering, like, can I, can I breathe this stuff in? So Jamie, the writer, Brian, and myself went up one day before shooting and we cleaned out this entire barn. I think we put in maybe eight hours of work just because it was such a perfect location and the windows provided such beautiful natural light. It was like we couldn't let it go. And then we had some weird scheduling things happen and our shoot day for this barn got pushed back a couple of weeks and the temperature plummeted there. So um, we were all staying in this RV outside of this location and we wake up at five in the morning to start prepping the location, but we hear these, these like tick, 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 and all of a sudden we go outside of the RV and it's hailing and it's snowing and there's hail in the middle of the desert. And it was like, how could this possibly happen? Like, when does it snow out here? And so we had to make some calls and, and get some heaters at the very last second. And it was weirdly like in the 20s out there. And so there's definitely that challenge of sometimes you face weather circumstances. And I think had we not had some of those space heaters, you know, it's questionable that our actors would have even really performed because they would have been so distracted by you know, this crazy temperature, you know, wind situation that we're dealing with out there. Yeah. Whew. Sorry well, for the tangents. Yeah. No, I mean, it just, you know, it just speaks to that. You just have to be how flexible you have to be. And it's like, no matter how many questions you ask, sometimes you can't you know, foresee everything. I think there's those questions with locations where are you close to a train station? Are you close to an airport? Are you, you know, all of those sound issues as well that you have to kind of, kind of navigate. Um, I mean, I think that was, it also speaks to the, to that point of how to make someone okay with you being in that space, especially, I know, you know, most of us are in the indie, indie world. So there's a little bit of that scavenger hunt that you have to do. Um, were there any other interesting, interesting ways that you like won someone's trust like that? Any of the other? Um, I, I think that like part of it is uh, when I say like having like having all of your ducks in a row before you have that first conversation, um, it helps to know you know like what's your what crew do you anticipate that day? Like how many people, um, talent? How many people? Um, you know when we talk about parking, um, you know like what does that all look like? And so before you even start the conversation with anyone, like it really just helps to show up and um, kind of know what you're really asking. Um, and also like, you know, if they're really hesitant to, you know, whatever you throw out or, you know, whatever it might be, like you can kind of read the situation and realize, okay, I have to scale back here. And, you know, we were gonna do, we were gonna have three trucks. Well, now we're gonna be working out of a van and, you know, it's, or, okay, great. Like, you know, they're totally cool with everything. and. Um, so it definitely helps to kind of like, just know where you're at in general. Um, and yeah, I mean, like it's building a relationship with, um, people's home, you know, people in their homes and their businesses. If you're asking to shoot at a bar, like are you asking to shut that bar down for the day, um, or are you going to have it open and then people can come and go? Um, you know, that's something that we did on our, our project was we, didn't have a lot of money and we needed to be in a bar. And so we, you know, I said like, it would be great if we, if we can be in, be here during the day and, um, you know, you guys can still be open and do your thing. So we just kind of had to work around that. Um, so being flexible is a certain thing too. Um, yeah, and I don't know, last thing is, I think it's really important just to uh, like, like arrive with an understanding, but also leave the location with some sort of understanding of like, we're all good here or, you know, something got broken and we're gonna like make it right. 
um, maybe not in the next like two hours, but you know, we'll, we'll circle back with you in a couple of days. Um, so yeah, I don't know, just like having those real relationships and, um, it's, yeah, it takes a lot of work to be honest with you. Um, yeah, I like, well, I was shooting a, a pilot in New York la last year and we had two bar locations and then in one of them we had, um, with the owner, we had discussed that it wouldn't be possible to have music on in because there, it was like half the had two rooms, and then in one room we were shooting, and in the other one it, it was still open, uh, and there wasn't really a door in between. So we were really were a little bit worried about this the sound of people chatting in the other room, but we were like there can't be music, impossible. And then the owner was fine with it. He was like, uh, he was a good friend of the director. Like, I don't mind. It's just half a day. It's fine. But then the people who were there started complaining and being really nasty about it. And they just wanted music. They just couldn't enjoy their food without music, apparently. And that became, we, we ended up paying those people for their, for their meals and everything. Because it's like, this is just taking too much time out of our day. I think to build on that really quick, I would say always to overestimate um, I think if you plan on having a crew of 10 people, tell the location that 15 people are going to show up. Um, I, I definitely think about situations that I got into when I started my career. Uh, one comes up in particular. It was the short film that we shot with a buddy of ours who was in the NFL, um, a pretty well-known player. And he was, he wanted to do some acting. And so he sort of teamed up with us and we decided to come up with this sketch, right? So we go to this location in Los Angeles and it's this warehouse and we're shooting this period piece and it's like this World War II-esque kind of a looking place. And we had told the location owner we were gonna have so many people and we're gonna be shooting on these cameras, et cetera. And of course, when our friend showed up, you know, he thought, oh, here's this football player. This is a more legit production than these um, filmmakers had sort of led me to believe and he started unplugging our lights in the middle of the shoot so he'd go around and he started ripping our lights out of the shoot he's like you didn't pay enough for this electricity and you know we had told him what lights we were going to use but I guess some people are not familiar with you know fluorescence and so there were kino flows so for filmmakers out there you know that like the power draw is next to nothing but we had to deal with this personality of this guy who came in and he saw you know, this nice Alexa that we had, you know, another donation from another friend. So it's like, you can call in favors, but I found with locations just to be as transparent as you possibly can. And, you know, hopefully they'll be reasonable and they're not going to start yanking your <laughs> lights out of the wall while you're trying to film. Yeah, definitely something I've found is having, um, you know, before the crew arrives, having that sort of walk through with um, the location owner. Uh, and definitely when you put down your deposit, having some sort of location agreement is, you know, pretty standard. But then also when you're done doing that walk through with them and then having them sign a release. So they don't come back to you two days later and they're like, oh, by the way, this paint was chipped and yeah. ram board cardboard you know protecting those corners that's going to be your best friend i mean another circumstance jamie and i were shooting this uh um man i can't remember the brand it was uh like a stereo set and so we were filming this beautiful mid-century modern home and i think the other thing is take a lot of photos of the location before you start shooting because there was a nick on the door and you know we went to our crew and of course no one's going to fess up to it because it's like this crazy expensive home. And, you know, we ended up fitting the bill, which was like a thousand dollars. I mean, it was like unbelievable. So protect yourself, I think. And, and I don't think that location people are generally out to get you. Like I don't have that sort of pessimistic view of people, but I do think that sometimes things get missed and it's a bummer and you know, it is what it is. And then, you know, you want to be a good steward of filmmaking and, you know, not ruin it for everybody else who's going to follow you because there are going to be other filmmakers that might want to use that location. And if you didn't put down RAM board or take care of the corners and, and do your due diligence, then you can ruin it for, you know, other people. Yeah, definitely. 
throw out there on the pictures front. I love because like coming up in, in the art department doing like resets on like entire houses and all these things like having pictures of like every possible thing it helps so much and then making them shareable so if the pictures are all like on your phone and there's 10 people resetting um it kind of helps just to be able to share like a google album or something like that um so that way like everyone can kind of reference their phones um and then when you're uh yeah so yeah, I think it also speaks to that, the, um, of having your whole team really communicate, like communicating to your whole team what that vision is of that space um, when you are in the beginning stages of that and who you're including on in your scouts and such. When you guys go on your scouts, are you you're bringing all of the whole team or what sort of your process for scouting, like any cool apps that you use, um, that sort of stuff. Uh, I, st well, uh, depending on if it's a location scout or a tech scout, of course. Um, but with our smaller projects, like I just, whoever is, uh, depending on the budget, but most of the time, just the people that are even available and happy to bring them along um, or willing, willing to come. Um, and then the first app I start with is uh, Sunseeker, I guess, or I have a couple of versions, Sun Surveyor, uh, and just checking out what the sun path is, sort of how we're going to use or fight against natural light. Um, and um, I think, and in general, the uh, uh, Artemis and all that kind of stuff, but I feel that a lot of people are using that. Yeah, do you yeah, want, I mean- I second that. Helios is another great Sunseeker app. Um, yeah. And yeah, for on location stuff, I mean, we did a short film, uh, High Ridge, that was a Western and um, all we used were bounces and we just planned our days accordingly. and we shot this sort of conversation scene outside and, you know, we knew that between the hours of two and six, um, that was our usable light. And then we planned our close-ups a certain time. I mean, you know, this is not locations, but you get it. Yeah, but it can make, I mean, it can make all the difference in planning your day uh, and how it, how that location looks. I mean, especially if it's bigger arch architectural uh buildings and stuff like that you can really win or lose <laughs> with the time that you're there yeah i mean I, I think that it's important to get as many people in there as you can as early as you can um you know there's limitations all the time um you know if someone's not on for the day and you're asking them to come out like that's maybe not cool but you know if you can arrange some type of scout at the tech level on so you know, when we're scouting to find the locations, we're not going to waste everybody's time. Um, you know, if it's not confirmed, then we're not going to be there. Then, you know. Um, but with that being said, um, you know, like I love being in there to see, like, okay, there might be something here that's going to work for art somewhere else. If we can ask them instead of having to go rent this thing over here, we can now just ask this location to borrow that, and then we can use it at this location and maybe give them a little bit of extra money. Um, you know. There's going to be a lamp over in the corner of that room that we didn't like think we needed, but now we can use it over here and I don't have to add that to whatever we're getting. So, um, you know, you're also going to see like you're next to a firehouse or, or yeah, you're next to the, the airfield. Like those are things that, you know, you might not think about if you're not the sound person um, or yeah. So um it's a luxury though, to have everybody out on tech scouts. Um, so I think like on the indie side of things, um, the, the more hats you can wear, the better earlier, I guess. Um, but you know, it goes both ways. And also maybe for the first thing, if you're trying to convince someone who owns an airfield and doesn't want to let you shoot in their barn, if you show up with like seven people, it might be a little intimidating at first. So, you know, sort of ease them into uh, bringing your entire crew out to to check out the location <laughs> that's a really good point um i just wanted to throw something out there too that i really like think this is really important and what we did on colony on swissy 
And I have a bunch of like screen grabs that I want to show you guys later, um, just to kind of like illustrate some of these like points. And but one of them was doing day for nights on interior, and then moving outside doing exteriors. I mean, this isn't rocket science; like we all do it. But I think it afforded us an opportunity on this project to do a lot of just to keep the look very dark and at like at night, but not have to shoot overnights. So I don't think we we wrapped maybe 12 a.m. at the latest on maybe one day, but most of the time we were out by 11 or 10 p.m. So that means we're, in, you know, the days are a little more normal. So all that means is that when we're in, in the, we're shooting the interior, we're tenting off all of the exterior. Um, so we have like a nighttime interior. And then, I don't know, freaking Julian, you guys can talk more about like basically pushing light in through the windows to motivate you know moonlight or street lamps and all those things to really sell that nighttime look and then once the sun really sets we'll rip all that tenting down we'll kick those lights out and we'll move into the exterior maybe it's an establishing shot maybe it's a dialogue scene maybe there's some action outside but that type of stuff can at least keep you from going overnight <laughs> i don't know for this very reason we um in the end decided to built our uh, bookstore in a studio because we had, we were shooting with a kit we knew that we had we wanted this nightly look as well we had a couple of moments where we had to look outside uh through the front door and it was like this is never gonna happen that a, a location is going to let us shoot for or well be there for five days in a row shoot overnight it's like it's never gonna happen um so then we decided that we weren't going to uh, invest money in uh, hiring a location and repurposing it for us, but just building something from scratch. How many days did you end up, well, how many days did it take you to build out that bookstore? Uh, I mean, we had a, that's a tough question because we started sort of planning it out two or three months prior um, and then we, I mean, it was a bookstore, so we needed books. And the, 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 we had two problems basically with locations um, on top of the, the, the things I discussed er earlier. And that was that most of the bookcases uh, or the bookshelves were white in, in, in most bookstores. Uh, and we wanted to have, so then that would light up the entire image already. And so we wanted a darker look. So we knew we needed dark bookcases and then we wanted to have control over which books were on the shelves and sort of how shiny they were uh, because we wanted an, an old and dulled look to it um, so we needed we I, I calculated uh, so I started drawing it in 3d uh, calculating then uh, how many shelves there would be and then how many books we would probably have uh, on each shelf so I calculated that we would need between 15,000 and 20,000 books to fill out the bookstore. Um, so I can share the screen uh, on my iPad. So, yep. And at, at what point did you make that decision to shoot in the bookstore? Did, had you visited a few bookstores and then had some initial conversations and then realized like, there's no way people are gonna let us be here for five days or? You know, yeah, or was it yeah. just aesthetically you were like, uh, we're never going to find what, what we have in, in our heads? It took us weeks to even find bookstores that were sort of close to what we were looking for. And then trying to even reach the owners and then discuss if we could put lighting there and shoot, if they would be willing to close for a week and stuff like that. It would just, and we, we realized that that was just never going to happen. Um, so then we, so it was pretty early on. Like we hadn't scouted anything really yet. We were, it was more sort of, it was just such a hassle already. They were like, well, if we're going to take this on, then let's just build it. Can you see the pictures? Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, so this is- Annabelle right there staining a bookshelf. That's a new yeah, production so, there. Yep. <laughs> this, here, this is our director that's painting. Awesome. That's 20,000 books right there. And we, so we were sorting them in, um, Sort of how shiny they were the super shiny ones were thrown out immediately uh and then the old the, we had sort of uh, a couple of different boxes for how beautiful we thought they were and then we would place them smartly throughout the location um and then is that warehouse that you're building in it is that 
a rental or did you guys have that space I, for, for free? Uh, or? We had, um, we had that space. Um, so I have a, a gear rental company uh, as well. And we, at that time rented a little, um, a, a little room there where we would had our, our gear. So we could use this uh, to, we weren't shooting here, but this was just prepping everything and testing it and seeing how big it was walking around it. And, and then we were shooting in the end, shooting in a theater and uh, you can see that a little, uh, and we had a real carpenter build the bookshelves. So we didn't build those ourselves. Um, so this is it all placed in the, where did you the source theater. the books from? Um, there was a, a second hand bookshop that went bankrupt and they wanted to sell, sell their entire inventory for 500 euros. <laughs> Wow. That's incredible. What would you have done had that bookstore not gone bankrupt? Or did oh, you make them an offer stuff. they couldn't refuse? Um, we started asking people to donate books. And uh, we, we were prepping uh, literally for, for months. So we already started sort of asking people for books. And we started buying sort of bigger chunks of books for 50 or, or 75 euros. And then so I would drive around my, my car uh in my car just picking up books everywhere and then we suddenly got this found this one thing um and we had we were thinking of maybe shifting books around for like planning our shots smartly uh, but in the end we didn't have to do that um so then here it's with the with the lights on so i can stop sharing my screen now i guess um you, you get the gist of it uh i can probably no. Uh, oh, yeah, I'll show one of those 360 photos as well. And then we're almost through our time. So then maybe Jamie can sh share some pictures as well. Yeah. That's it in 3D. Wow, that's so incredible. Wow. And yeah, this is what a the... feat. I mean, that must have been awesome when you guys finished that just to walk around that space. It must have been incredible. It was, it was, it was it really, really hurt to break it down. Um, because it just felt so so real and even for the actors and everyone like the moment you stepped inside that space it was just magical with that blue top light it was it was really there and it just yeah it, it felt as magical as it as it is in the in the film in the end which really helped everyone like from shooting it to the actors and it was really i mean it's yeah the best thing we did for the production for sure I think that's a really good point in that like what you see on screen is one thing, but the world that really sets the tone. Um, and so the, like the fact that you're able to do that in a studio um, really kind of like gets everybody into the headspace and like into the world of that you're, we're all, that you're all working towards. So that's kind of one of the benefits I feel like of being on location. And when you can bring that in the studio environment, like heck yeah, more, more power to you. Um, so hopefully we can do more of that you know, given the circumstances of how challenging it might be to be on location, you know, at least. The blue screen at all. <laughs> yeah. How from, from load in to load out, how long were you in that studio? Remember? It'd be, I guess seven, seven days. Yeah, something like that. So we had seven or eight days. Um, wasn't too bad, actually. I think we, we managed to, to get it all out in one day, which is still nuts to me. <laughs> <laughs> because the um, books alone were three, were three truckloads. So we had to, yeah. <laughs> and we still have it. And we folded it all, we folded it all up and it's in a warehouse now somewhere stored. Hope, hoping we still we'll st still do something with it one day. Yeah. Um, Jamie, did you want to share some, some pics? Yeah, sure. Um, we, have our, we have our trailer up on, I think that was available, but the full project isn't. So I just kind of went through a lot of our shots and wanted to kind of give you a, do you see the screen? Yeah, is that? Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay, great. So it's chronological through the story and I try to kind of group things, but, and Julian, please like chime in on all this stuff too. I'll just kind of like 
there's 17 pages. So we're gonna go super quick, but right down here, um, we've got this like wide shot. Like, can you see my cursor? Um, mm -hmm. This is an example of kind of like introducing some larger set pieces to give us the illusion that this is like, you know, uh, what did we do? We did like a, like a, a mail slot and a, I mean, it's generic, but it at least like adds something. Um, the same kind of goes for, uh, there's the barn that Julian was talking about that we cleaned out. Um, and then we kind of had this exterior scene. Let's see. Yeah. So, you know, in the top left hand corner here is like another, you know, so, some set pieces that we did to do this like bus sort of stop, I, you know, it, it gets the job done. Was it like the best version of a bus stop? Maybe not, but you know, we're just trying to do what we can. Yeah, we had a crazy schedule and we just had to like put up a bus stop really close to the motel that you see there. And yeah, uh, yeah we're like, how do we create a bus stop? Well, um, you know, one of those poles with the schedule and then the, the bench and the trash can and that was it. And how, how much, because your, your color scheme is also very particular and sort of deliberate, which gives it a very high end view, I think. Um, how much of that is sort of, do you add with just those little elements and how do you plan, do you plan that? And do you, do you scout for that as well? I think so. I mean, at least we started with some of the blank canvases of, we knew that we had to have a bus stop and it was sort of a simultaneous research, what props were available that we could get at the prop houses in, in Los Angeles. And then what were sort of the compositions and then thinking about where the sunlight was coming from, you know, uh, let's, let's create a nice backlight for that bus stop scenario. And so it sort of all came together at, at once, but in terms of the aesthetic, I would say that's something that I thought about uh, when I was scouting all of these locations throughout the whole time is that sort of similar deserty color palette. Yeah, I mean, really like from the onset of the treatment forward, we're really trying to hit a look. So, you know, even before the project is greenlit, you know, when it's like mood boards, when we're in the location sort of phase, you know, there's a lot of stuff that's guiding the look. Um, so, you know, if it's like Julian put together like 50 photos that were just like inspiration, and then that kind of guides like where we, where we go for with the location. So I'm just gonna kind of keep scrolling real quick, just be like 30 seconds. But we did this like banana museum. So Julian found this, literally like banana objects and um, Brian wrote it into the script and it turned into a thing. So we're in the International Banana Museum for, and this again is one of these um, tented day for night moving outside. So the characters walk in. So we actually shot this at the top of the day and all the in interior. And then we moved outside to catch their entrance and exit. Um, but the, the tenting too, let's just kind of like let them literally walk in. And you can actually see some of the tenting in the back there. Um, if we were like really into VFX, we would have cleaned that up, but it's so quick. Um, and then here's that bar that we were talking about. And um, again, this was open during the day and we're here during the day, day for night. Um, we have a character kind of walk on. I, see, this doesn't, oh, I can hide this. Sorry, I'm new. Um, <laughs> Yeah, so, yeah. You're, so how do you, how important do you think it is that you that you're able to write to your locations as well? So that is your it, like, yeah. Julian, I feel like you. How are we able to? Sorry, to watch our locations. To write like to write them oh, in. You said with the, I mean, I think at least for the budget level that we were on, we definitely weren't able to create our space. So, um, you know, I mean, I think every location, so take this one, this is Jackalope's house, right? Um, Swissy, our character there to the left is posing as a escort. Uh, so she can get some, uh, extract some information from this sort of scumbag character. And um, when we started blocking the scene in the location, I thought it was really funny that she was sort of dodging his advances by going around that table. And so we made the whole centerpiece of this location and this scene um, around this table and letting it be this sort of cat and mouse game, which ended up being really funny because he'd go and he'd chase her one way to the right and she'd go the other way. 
and it sort of relieves some tension and it, it helped us sort of tote that line of, of comedy and, and drama that, that I try to go for in, in some of my stuff. Yeah, it, real quick, I'm gonna pop down. There's a moment where we were in this house and we were scouting it and it's it was, okay, like long story short, it was filled, so we're in this garage right here and it's filled with like stuff and the character's looking for something. So Brian, Julian and I are here looking at this garage and we love this house and it's full of things and the character's looking for something. So Brian's like, well, what if there was like a lot of like an animal painting? And then it's like, what about a cat painting? So then it's like, okay, what if it's filled with cat paintings? So we have this like moment in the movie where he's like, wow, that's a lot of cat paintings. So now he's looking for this thing that's hidden behind a cat painting, but it's gonna take him longer than it. And so we're kind of building tension through that. And it's a kind of a comedic beat that I feel like hopefully works. Um, there he is. He's got the briefcase. Found oh, it yeah. under a cat yeah. painting. <laughs> yeah. Um, and then he's, and then, you know, another moment is just like, we, we totally played the location. So then he finds the briefcase under a cat painting and then he has to hit this garage button, which is on the opposite end of the garage and run through the garage and sort of dodge the, you know, the laser that automatically stops the door. So we just had a lot of fun and just we're, you know, really improvised and, and kept an open mind as soon as we found these locations. And how, oh yeah, sorry, Krika. Uh, how did you find those? I, f I feel that the house locations are always sort of the hardest because then you have to, like, it's someone's personal space, yeah. which is slightly different from a barn or a bar, which is a public space already. Um, uh, I don't want to eat too much into the, the Q&A part, but really quick on the house location. I think it was, I called a bunch of businesses in Palmdale and I was looking for a mid-century house and, you know, a friend of a friend of a friend of a friend, like after calling a million people, we finally stumbled upon that house that you see that ends up being this sort of gang hideout. And it was really fortuitous because this woman, unfortunately, her house had been broken into by a gang and they had graffitied the entire house. And so when we looked at it, we went to visit the, the location and she was really embarrassed about, you know, how the, the, the sort of shape in which the house was. And I said, this is perfect. Like, this looks exactly like a bunch of kids have taken over this house and, and destroyed it a little bit. So, you know, it, we sort of got lucky a little bit. I mean, we got lucky and it was just a lot of work. I mean, I can't stress how much just like brute force filmmaking is. I think everyone knows that like, if you want the right location, then you're gonna spend days and days and days and weeks, and you're gonna call a million people before you find the right place. One like last, no, 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 sorry, sorry, I know. No, 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 go ahead, Jamie, finish your yeah, stuff. I just, want to make sure we answer some questions. For sure. Like the one thing that like saved our butt on this was um, we rented an RV and we lived out of the RV for the whole three weeks that we shot. And so what that let us do was like basically wake up and like wake up at onset and fall asleep on set. And so it got bought us an extra couple hours to be able to have the time to wrap out, wrap in. Julian could block, like I could do set work. Like it just gave us an opportunity. So um, I wouldn't recommend it if you don't have to, but if you- the RVs yeah. are awesome. <laughs> yeah. Anyway. No, it was great. I mean, no division between home life and work life, clearly, if you're sleeping on set, essentially, but. Yeah. Um, no, you're in shoot mode. Come on. Right. That's right. Um, I haven't, I'm so enjoying this and seeing your production stills. I'm so glad you guys showed those. So thank you for doing all that. But I want to make sure that we are addressing our YouTube questions. Um, this is a, an interesting one um, from Jack Spypeck. Um, have you ever had to make a major script adjustment because of location restrictions? Um, and I did want to preface this little story quickly that, um, so um, Quentin Tarantino shot The Hateful Eight in Telluride. Um, and um, I was in an ancillary, tiny little part of that. But I do know that he doesn't do um, visual effects very much. So sorry, Kate. But um, he uh want to shoot in um telluride for the snow and it didn't snow it had like record nothing like no snow and so they waited they waited for days and weeks and they went way over budget and way over schedule but you're when you're quentin tarantino you can do that they were literally just hanging out waiting for the snow to fall so 
in independent production, you can't do that. So, I mean, have you had to make kind of adjustments and, and you know, decisions and on the fly based on locations? I have like, just my, my like initial, just quick yeah. major is that um, you have to get it right on the page. And mm -hmm. so when you spend that much time getting it right, um, I would say like, what what you might what might feel like an like a, an obstacle that you cannot overcome and you need to go back and redo the script to a certain big in a big way um i would say that like hopefully there's another way around that instead of redoing the script because ideally up to that point you've put a we, lot of time into that um two two minutes with the banana museum moment um we rewrote the script because we found a more interesting location and so to boil down that scene, you know, in the most basic, it was uh, our character Swissy shows up and there is this sort of uh, character Rhonda who knows all of the uh, underground criminal dealings of this sort of desert city. And it was a conversation on a street corner in the script and it was pretty uninteresting. And then we came across the Banana Museum and one thing led to another and it was like, well, what if Rhonda works at the Banana Museum? Or what if, you know, the guy who runs the Banana Museum sells drugs out of the Banana Museum? And then, you know, her whole motivation is to go there and she convinces Swissy to, you know, pick the lock because Swissy is an expert lock picker, criminal type of a person. So then they go in and this whole conversation where Swissy is trying to extract information from Rhonda happens over the course of looking through these ridiculous banana objects and I think it elevated that scene from just a traditional coverage of a wide over over on the street corner and you know had some more character and the location became a character in itself in the story. Great. Um, well I guess we kind of touched on this a little bit on uh, public spaces but um, Jason Kunza wanted to know that he's got a short film that mostly takes place in a restaurant. Any advice on shooting in a restaurant and getting one to let you on? So we were kind of talking about a little bit before, don't come on too strong with your entire crew and cast and your grandparents when you go in for the first meeting, but any other tips on helping to kind of grease the wheels and secure the location? Uh, I would say try to think with them sort of in, in terms of your schedule or when, when you can shoot, like, are there, are they closed? Do you, if you have a location that you really want to shoot, like, are they closed certain days? What hours might work for them? That kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. uh, and then what I find, what really hard with um, restaurant locations, most of the time is that you'll, you'll also need extras to sort of fill. So how big is it and how can you shoot it in a way and how many extras can you get to make it look realistic or does it have to look busy or not? I mean, depending yeah. on your story, obviously, but mm -hmm. I feel that you can really help yourself in planning out your day in that regard as well. Like, how are you, how am I going to cover this? And when do I need people to fill up all that space? Mm -hmm. And food, maybe they can provide craft service and maybe they can provide meals. I and mean, that's another thing to, to keep in mind at a restaurant is like, don't necessarily bring in a bunch of outside food. If they make food, that could be sort of touchy for some places. So you could also. Um, <laughs> I feel like you, you could look at standing sets too. Um, I don't love them all the time. So like a, sta a standing set would be like, let's say a restaurant that's pre-built in a studio, but you're gonna have a similar problem you still have to fill it with people and you have to light a lot more usually because it's usually just like that's it and you know it comes with its own problems or you could do some stuff in kind like we've done some stuff with stores and then afterwards shop you know like a commercial for them or a sketch that promotes them so you know try to use your skills to help them too yeah especially if you can find a smaller more mom and pop kind of place that barter thing can definitely work so we're always looking for good nice photos and i think we're probably going to see the hours of some of these restaurants are going to be a little more restricted when we go back so there's going to be bigger windows of time hopefully that there that maybe something an opportunity like this could be available oh last quick thing also you could just get really creative and say like a lobby of a building might look enough like a restaurant where if you brought in tables and chairs, I mean, those are relatively inexpensive props. 
And if you find a location with great natural light windows that could look like the bare bones architecture of a restaurant, then you can bring in just a few things, you know, like the bus stop that then sells something that, you know, it's not. Yeah, or outdoor cafes where you just have a cool looking wall and then you can set up some nice tables and umbrellas. That's a great point. That's great. Um, as, as, well, kind of feeding off of what you were just saying, Kate, um, Tucker Chronicles um, wanted to know, um, what do you think film locations will look like in the time of COVID? Um, on location and on set? I mean, do you kind of have an idea of, are we going to be shifting more towards set stuff or studio work as opposed to on location because of the nature of the world? I'm, a, I'm definitely expect, I mean, in a commercial, on the commercial side of things, definitely. Mm. Um, because otherwise it just, it takes so much, it takes so much more time to do it on location that mm -hmm. if there's uh yeah then it just starts to become a money thing and i think it's just cheaper mm -hmm. to do it in the studio mm -hmm. kate maybe you have more insight on this but how do you feel about like virtual production and you know i feel like one of the things that makes the mandalorian the mandalorian um i don't know if you can maybe touch on that real quick well i mean it definitely um allows for like far off and like fantastical sort of things where you might not go to Italy, but now you can stay in LA, and, you know, utilize newer technologies for that. Um, I think yes, and it's so hard. It's getting, it's not cheap. Cause yeah. even it's, it's not, no, it's not cheap. It's still a lot of that technology is still proprietary. Um, uh, and you know, it's you're in a studio space, which you have to make sure that the the airflow is such, and you have pods of people coming in and out where everyone's not on set at the same time. But then, if you have a back lot or a ranch that has a lot of cool standing sets, you're outside, and can you use natural lighting? So, I think there's gonna be maybe different concessions, but I still. I'm hopeful that we'll still be able to have some um, variety. Mm -hmm. And so, I mean, things are obviously changing day by day and minute by minute, but it sounds like, you know, there's gonna be new guidelines, but new incentives in different locations. Like I, I heard that New York is cutting their incentive for independent production. So maybe it'll leave New York and another country will incentivize you to go elsewhere. So where we shoot and how we shoot it sounds like it's going to be changing because of all of this but time will tell um i'm gonna do one more question um kind of going back to what frank was saying um when you do you have a, a padding for your budget um for these pop-up sort of problems um is that comforting from contingency or from um, insurance when you nick a door or if, you know, God knows what happens, what damage you get caused, you know, what, how do you guys handle that financially? Um, I always build in, I build in a line item for damage, but then I also do have 10%, um, if not more, um, contingency for that sort of thing. And do you have insurance for when you're shooting on location? Yeah. yeah. Totally. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Most places, I mean, a lot of places won't let you shoot. Uh, and you, yeah, like you said, you can't get a permit without insurance. So, yeah, we're permitted and you do have insurance. The problem with insurance is not a problem, but usually the deductible, and you know, like if it's a NIC or if it's something that you can work out through contingency, you're probably not going to be activating your insurance policy. Um, yeah. Yeah. I mean, Unless you're yeah. driving through a wall or something. Yeah. Or, you know, you can always like rob Peter to pay Paul type thing. It's like, well, okay, that happens. And now we can't do this. So, uh, right. 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 Um, well, great, guys. I mean, that like literally just blew by. I found myself, I didn't even know what time it was. And I was just staring at all of your production stills, imagining that we're in this pre-COVID era, just on set making cool content. But um, I want to make sure that uh, everybody can watch your your projects. First of all, Locks, next Series Fest season six, really exciting. 
That's also I, I, a super um as my other shirt. oh my gosh I, yes and super i'm so we she has two projects this year at series fest super is phenomenal um so kate two times at series fest this year and i think that we should all go watch breaks project so we can get that set out of storage so it can get some use That'd what do you nice. think get that <laughs> off the ground and someone's gonna pick it up and and run with it so we can use that set um so thank you guys for being here and again i mean the winner in amsterdam three o'clock in the morning you go to bed now everyone else should have like a celebratory like, drink like waking up now like <laughs> let's start the day the, you're gonna start your day <laughs> no. no thank you good um everyone thank you so much for coming thank you for being here thank you from everyone at serious fest um i hope you enjoyed this hangout um, we have one more next week, um, and then we're going to be kind of pivoting to all things virtual festival. So um, follow us on social media for updates. And then also on social, you can find more about these fine creators. Um, and we look forward to seeing you online soon. Thank you guys so much again. Thanks, Thanks, for, having uh, thanks for having us. Donate to Serious Fest. Donate. Donate to seriousfest.com. Yeah. Thank you guys. Bye. Bye. Bye.